afternoon, I should say. I'm going to go ahead and start with reading his text, uh, Psalm 1830. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trusted him. And in the uh, New, I mean, uh, New American, it's, As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried and a shield to all who take refuge in him. In both of these verses, we see that this way is set apart. In Isaiah, he calls it a highway of holiness. Several other passages that tell us about his way are some of these. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. From Deuteronomy, he says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. <coughs> These also describe God's character, it reveals his nature. And he calls us into this way with him. He wants us to be taught to be like him, is implied. You shall be holy, for I am holy. The word of the Lord is tried and proved. Psalm 19.7, I'm sorry. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. From Psalms 119, it says, your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves you. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every, one of God, I mean, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Now these are written for our, our learning. And while we're in the earth, we are tested to see if we believe these words, his <coughs> words. And he has provided every advantage for us to do that. Now this morning we covered many of those uh, advantages. It's plain and clear that he wants us to know him. He wants us to be able to, uh, to come to him and to be perfected. This is, this is his will. I thought of another one, though, from Acts that I thought uh, came to bear on this, too. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not very far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. So see, he, he told us that, and he made a way by putting us in certain areas with certain exposure to certain people, uh, just like we've found here, uh, to come to know him. And so he has, he's made every provision for, for us to, uh, to be able to take advantage of these things. He wants us to know him, come to him. He is a shield to all. Now, is it for all? No, it is not for all. It is for those who take refuge in him or trust in him. And that has is, that is come to bear in, in many passages. Psalm 30, um, 84, 11 to 12 says, For the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. There's always those little connections of who it is that this is going to, this advantage is going to. It's actually not that it would be for just anyone, for anyone that uh, is just going their own way, or anyone who is rebellious or not of, the, of God. It is it's clear in the scripture, and there's so many people that do think that is, it is for all, but it, it is not. He knew that there would be great conflict in the world and that we would have to battle the enemy of our souls as well as those in the world. So he gave us this promise that he would be our buckler, buckler or our, our shield. <coughs> Psalm 18, 1 to 3, David spoke this song to God the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. And we will be able to do the same thing, and to, to give praise and to recognize that it is from him. He is a very present help in time of need. Amen. Very good. Aren't these words precious? This declaration, our brother David, two times. Of course, our brother makes this, makes this declaration to us in uh, Psalm 18 and in 2 Samuel 22. The one, the one in 2 Samuel 22 seems to be a little more personal. The version of it, we might call it, seems to be a little more personal. There are uh, some variations in the wording from the from the psalm, which is probably uh, 
modified, I don't know if that's a good term to use or not, for public presentation, whereas the version of 2 Samuel was very personal to David, uh, maybe like a journal entry. Uh, they're both extensive, uh, 50, 51 verses, each one of them, as we have them in our English Bibles. Their focus is this, God is the source, the subject, and the summation, the producer, the process, and product of revelation concerning himself and things not seen. See, he has made these things known. These are not something we know. Moses said these words. Nobody can go up to heaven and get it and bring it down. Nobody can go down into the deeps and recover these things and bring them up again. It cannot be done by men. It's not in the power of men to do this. These things of God's immutability and sovereignty are his alone. No man can enter into this arena. Can't even get in there, let alone find their way in or stumble in accidentally or something like, like someone, you know, someone may stumble on a vein of gold. Someone may stumble on a spring of water or any number of things like that. Or, or like how Joplin was founded, someone stumbled on the ore that was around here and so forth. You don't do this with this revelation of God's immutability. It must be revealed, and then, as has been said, it must be believed in order to engage it. And we are challenged by its revelation, by the nature of its revelation. We are challenged to engage it, as has been said. It's not just there for information, just so that we can pick it up and, and uh, look it over once in a while, set it on a shelf, and isn't that admire that? Isn't that wonderful? Look at this trophy I've got for Not so. <laughs> not so. God has given us this that we may know him. Now, men have always known and recognized that there are things unseen. The men on the boat with Jonah, they knew there were things unseen. The wind was unseen and it was tearing them to pieces and dominating them, totally controlling them. It was an unseen thing. These are unseen things that David writes about. Things that men may theorize about or philosophize about or hypothesize about but God testifies you know when you testify you talk about what you've seen and what you know well God's able to do that he's the only one who knows these things and he's been willing to testify this truth and it's about himself it's not just about the environment it's not just about human circumstances and the course of human events like fortune tellers or so forth, you know, the supposed, supposed fortune tellers and prognosticators who can, uh, whether they're predicting personal things or financial things or uh, political things or what, not so, not so. These are the things pertaining to God himself because we know that over the wrecks of time, God will stand. His, his, uh, his purpose, his pleasure, and his will will remain. When the superstructure of life falls down of its own weight, that too by his design. When all else fails, it'll be by the design of God, by the extension of his power and working. Then men must choose. In, in light of this revelation, I mean, men must choose whom to believe, what to believe, where to place their trust. What God has revealed, only faith can uh, recognize, recognize that this is from God, and then take hold of it to engage it themselves. To, we, you know, we use the, the uh, imagery of plugging into it. You, you uh, partake of it yourself then, only by faith. Faith doesn't make it true, it engages it. <laughs> These eternal realities that expose the heart. And then, of course, this reality will have a profound effect on the believer. Their thoughts, their words, their deeds, it will affect every part of their being. They turn from the world and they join themselves uh, to the Most High. 
according to how he has made himself known. And those of us who live in, this, in, the, in the light of the gospel, that's what he's made known. This is how you engage with God. This is how you join yourself to him. It's by his son. And all the things then that the Spirit has revealed about us dying to self and being raised to walk with him and then continuing to walk with him in that light and that truth that he has made known. This immutable truth, unchangeable, unshakable compared to other things, compared to anything. David extols and praises and exalts our Lord by this word and in this song. That's why we use how we use, continue to use songs today. It's an expression of God's glory and the honor that is due to him for his great works and the revelation of his nature to the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know and understand. These words appeal to the heart and mind with, with an enormous amount of truth. Just, just this main text has an enormous amount of truth on which you can, you can sit yourself down in its, in its thoughts and see a, a, a great vista of God's nature and God's working, God's power and God's will in these things. They appeal to the heart and mind in that way. You can meditate and muse or think on these things. And this thinking will honor God as, as it yields itself to him, as the thoughts yield itself to him. That will honor him. He, he will be blessed. The, the thinker, the muser will be blessed, and God will be blessed as well. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Justice and truth are the foundation of his throne by which he rules the heavens and the earth. Things visible and invisible, thrones and dominions and powers, righteous and wicked, of every realm. Blessed is the one who believes, appreciates, and understands and conforms their thinking and their behavior to the reality of God's immutable counsel. As for God, his way is perfect. His way is perfect. That is complete, full, without spot or blemish. From conception, he's conceived these things in himself, see. We say this repeatedly, don't we? God didn't consult with anyone else. Didn't take a survey. What do you, what do you, what do you all think about this? Uh, I was throwing around some ideas. I just wanted to get some feedback from... No, no. Men do that. Business people do that. Politicians do things like that. Not so the Most High. No man can conceive. No, one can, no man can add to, modify in some profitable, beneficial way what the Most High thinks. All men would do is just take it and use it for themselves. They've proven that, haven't they? If they, if they don't believe, they'll, just, they'll, they'll, they'll attempt to steal it. They'll commit larceny. <laughs> take it into their own possession. And some will claim, oh, look, this is mine. This is mine. Look what I've come up with. You know, That's what men do. Churchmen do that, don't they? Religious people do that. Look what we've done for ourselves. Yes, we're really intelligent. We're really holy. We're really this, that, or the other, you know, when it's God's truth. Or it was God's truth at the beginning. Of course, once men do that with it, it's no longer God's truth, is it? It isn't. His way is perfect, without spot or blemish, from conception to execution of his counsel, which he hid in himself, the Apostle Paul says, from the beginning of the world. All his works were finished from the foundation. He knew what he was doing all along. There's no uh-oh. There's no uh, backup. There's no do-over. You know, back up and try this again. Uh, it didn't work out the way the first time. You know, all of us have done things like that. We do things like that regularly. It's not so with the Most High. All things. His, his immutable counsel takes into account everything. Everything. And his ways... What he's making known is not affected by the choices that men make. Whether it's pleasing to him or displeasing to him. Whether, whether it honors him or he abhors it. It doesn't affect what he's doing. He's already accounted for it. The decision of Adam and Eve in the garden. 
The decision of the generations down to Noah. The decision of those who made the tower in the plain of Shinar. Uh, the decision of Abraham, the decision of his brothers, the decision of his father, all those decisions. God accounted for all of those things. The decisions of uh, all three of the Pharaohs, you know, talking about Abraham's Pharaoh and Joseph's Pharaoh and Moses' Pharaoh. Then, of course, we've got another Pharaoh later in the days of uh, Hezekiah, don't we? I think Hezekiah or, or uh, one of the other kings there. We've got three, four, four or five different uh, prominent Pharaohs there in the, in the scriptures. God was not affected or changed. His decision, his will, his purpose, not affected by them. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Balthasar, uh, Cyrus, uh, Sennacherib, uh, name them all. Name anyone. He's accounted for them all. For them all. From Noah's generation to Joseph in Egypt to the giving of the law to David's enthronement to the Savior's birth, all of these, all of these were orchestrated brought to pass, fulfilled by him whom our brother Daniel saw as the ancient of days. His ways are perfect. Things revealed to the fathers, to Moses, to David, to Daniel, from Daniel's visions to John's visions, things which had not entered into the heart of men, made known by him. Have ye not known, the prophet says, have ye not heard? Hath it not been told to you from the beginning? Now these are words, of course, to Israel. About halfway between Moses and the Savior. So they had some revelation. They had a, a fair amount of revelation upon which to think about these things. Hasn't been, has, these are rhetorical questions. Hasn't it been told you? They knew the answer, see. Have you not heard? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Well, that's why God had to ask the question. Because they hadn't understood. See? And this was to stir them up to think about it. <laughs> if they were willing. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. That stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain. And spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. His way accounted for fallen humanity. His terrible fruit and the execution of the resolution of his counsel in the seed of fallen woman. Now that's not the phrase that the Apostle Paul uses. He calls it the seed of woman. We know she was fallen woman in her seed. This is the one appointed, chosen by God, anointed by God. No contingency plans, no makeup in this process. He works all according to his good pleasure, which he hath proposed in himself, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, that's where our brother Paul wrote of these things. David wrote about it in one way. The Apostle Paul wrote about it in this way. In light of the gospel, see, he was able to see more of these things that, remember what the Savior said about it? Many kings and righteous men long to see the things that you see, to hear the things that you hear. So our brother Paul was able to write about these things, about his way. His way is perfect. Spiritual forces of wickedness cannot intervene or interfere or detour this good pleasure. It's a good pleasure. That's already been emphasized. It's good. His pleasure, but it's still good. Unlike the pleasures of men. His counsel, the counsel of the Most High, that he works out in the course of human events. The wills and desires of men, as I said, have no bearing on what he has determined, appointed, and set in motion. It's for his name's sake. Now, those who believe benefit. But it's not for our sake, primarily. It's only secondarily. In the, in the, in the fruit of it. We're part of the fruit. And then we also benefit with the fruit. This is so critical. I'm so grateful to be able to see this after so many years. His wisdom then presses men. This, this revelation and wisdom of God, which is perfect, it presses men into a place where they have to reveal themselves by their choice. It shows, as some have coined the phrase, their true colors. What they really care about. 
what they're really interested in, what they really love, what they're really hungry for, what they'll sell their soul for. See? Like Judas did. Sold his soul for what he didn't even want. Within minutes. It may have been a couple hours, but that's still minutes, isn't it? He couldn't stand to hold it in his hand. He didn't want to see it anymore. He didn't want it in his possession, did he? Sold his soul for that, see? Of course, he'd been in that place for a long time, hadn't he? He'd been stealing money from them. No one knew but the Savior. Did I not myself all choose you, choose you all? Yet one of you is the devil. A year before, the Savior said that. John records it there in John 6. The Almighty raises up certain ones like Moses and Pharaoh who contended with Moses. Or others who, Brother Ricky mentioned Cyrus in the text there in Isaiah 46. When the 46? Yeah. Cyrus. And naming him some 100, 120 years before his birth. A man who, he, he, who according to human origin, should not have been king. He was, he was not in the royal line. He, he was part of it, but not close enough to take the throne, except that God had appointed him, see? And so the circumstances turned and worked to where he was, and then he gives this decree to the Jews to return to Jerusalem and to pay out of the national treasury of the Medes and the Persians what they needed to restore their city and their temple. Their temple first and then their city later. So see how God works these things. His days, man's days, are as grass as the flower of the field. He flourisheth, the wind passeth over it, it is gone, the place thereof shall no one know it. But God knows and God works in all of these things. So we recall, uh, this has already been mentioned today. I'm not surprised someone's already mentioned it. These words of... Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's graduate thesis. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from, every, from generation to generation. Now that's the opening words of what he had published. See, nation, his kingdom-wide publication of his graduate thesis. Now here's the closing after he'd done the, the uh, you know, his extensive grass of the field research. Think about that a minute. Here's his conclusion. I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, his ways judgment. Those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Now, Nebuchadnezzar knew something about both sides of that, see? Is this not the great Babylon I've made for the glory of my majesty? It had been a year since Daniel had told him to repent. It had been a year. And he thought, well, maybe Daniel wasn't right about this one, you know. Too late, king. Too late. His words and experience conform perfectly to David's report. As for God, his way is perfect, and the word of the Lord is tried. And the idea, of course, as Sister Debbie said, is that the earth is a testing place. Now, not for God's truth, not in the sense of we've got to decide whether you can depend on it or not. Is it, is it really what it, well, from our perspective, maybe. But see, men don't determine whether it's true or not except in our own experience, which is really low on the scale of what's important, see. It's true. These things were true before they were written down. It was a reality of how God manages all things and works all things according to this counsel. It was, it's always been true. Men just didn't recognize it. Or maybe angels didn't either. Certain some angels didn't, did they? Yeah, the ones who rejected it, they didn't recognize that. And so God has created an environment, carved out this bubble that we call time. It has a beginning and an end. 
He's carved this out of eternity. And he says, here, we're going we're to have an enterprise here. We're going to show these things. We're going to display these things in the experience of these beings upon whom I will put my image, the stamp of my image, a little portion of his image in them. And then they will live these things out in this environment where they will choose. God's already chosen, of course. It's like, like I tell I, I talk a lot I, to the kids at Juvia. I talk a lot about these things. And, and I tell them, we get, we get about this much choice. And all the other choices are God's. <laughs> he makes every other choice. We get about this much. And then, of course, if you make certain choices and you start down a certain road, you're going to end up wherever that road ends up. One of them is called the straight, narrow way that leads to life, and the other the broad, crooked way that leads to destruction. There's only two. There's only two. Remember the heavenly messenger? Men want to talk about the word of the Lord being tried in the earth. Remember the messenger that came to Zechariah? This priest who was cultured and educated in the things of God. Now, we don't know the personal circumstances of how often he had done this. If he'd ever, perhaps, I've heard it suggested, maybe this is true. This may have been the only time in his ministry at the temple that he was chosen to go in and burn incense. In his long life, it may have been the only time. We don't know. It was done by Lot. So there he is, burning incense, and all at once he realizes He's not alone. And when he sees the other person, he realizes he, he really is alone. It's just him and this heavenly messenger. And that was not a comfortable feeling, of course. And the message is delivered. And Zechariah is, uh, would the word incredulous be a good word to describe it? He's, he doesn't scoff. It's just that this is so personal that it's, it's almost for joy he could hardly believe it. And for understanding at this point, at their age. And so he asks the fateful question. Fateful is not really a very good word. He asked the wrong question. The word of the Lord is tried. Now, Zechariah knew this. He knew that the word of the Lord was tried. He knew that all his ways are perfect. He knew that. He was a godly man. He would not have been chosen. He and Elizabeth would not have been chosen for this if they were not righteous. And Well, the record says they were righteous, doesn't it? In all their ways. Yet he asked the wrong question. And so the answer then is, you know, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. That was the answer. Yeah. That was the answer, see. I am sent to speak unto thee and show thee these glad tidings. That was the answer. And Zechariah knew it, and he knew that that was a wrong question. Every question is not a good question, huh? When it comes to his ways are perfect, the word of the Lord is tried. Now Mary, later, she didn't hesitate one bit, and she did not have the advantages that Zechariah had of the culture of the priesthood, even from a gender perspective. You know, the, the men, the young men were educated more and in different ways than the young women were, and yet, when it comes to the word of God, the ways of the Lord, human culture is not the determining factor, is it? <laughs> Yeah, may it be done unto me according to your word. And this Gabriel who stood in the presence of God was pleased. He was much more pleased at this young woman. Who perhaps maybe she'd never even been out of Nazareth. We don't know. Wouldn't have been surprising for her to have lived her whole existence in that place. But she believed. 
Her faith was the substance that gave her hope and evidence of what was not seen in those words. And it remains so for those who engage its truth and its wisdom and its righteousness. David and other prophets experienced this reality of God's power that was wielded in the truth that they spoke amidst the lying facades of, of the earth. David, for instance, as he confronted the giant, he tested the word of the Lord there. It was, it was shown. Now, David had confidence. He wasn't saying, I hope this works. Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't be able to stand there. He wouldn't be able to go out there like that if he thought, I hope this works. It was for everybody who was watching, see, to show that, as was said, God is God. His word does not fall to the ground empty. He confirms it in wisdom, power, goodness, righteousness, mercy, kindness, and favor, even in this hostile Pardon me, in this hostile environment. None can escape this light that God has sent, even as the Savior said. Light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than the light. Not everyone, but many did. They loved the darkness. They fled into the darkness. But of course they couldn't escape. They couldn't escape. Even the psalmist knew this. The darkness hideth not from thee. The night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Yeah. See? Yeah. So he sends his light into the dark. And the darkness flees. Screaming in rage like the demons. What do we have to do with you? We know who you are. See, they had, if he came into the proximity, into their area, they, they were, and we don't, we don't know the details of this, but they, it's like they were forced to confront him and confess who he was. And then, screaming in rage, they had to go wherever he sent them. What is your name? He said. And they had to tell him. The only mercy they asked for was unclean animals. And then those animals took their own lives. So none could stand against the extension of God's purpose and will in the earth, where, where it's tried, where the light is tried in the darkness. And of course, the light always triumphs. Yes. The darkness can't stop the light at all. All it can do is come in when the light goes away. Otherwise, it becomes light. All things become light. See? Now, God may give a little place for the darkness to go to, but it's not very big. The Savior confronted and overcame, he did, the hard hearts of those in Israel and their leaders when they refused to receive him. He, he did overcome them. We know that, don't we? In this trying of the word of the Lord, he showed. No one could beat him back. No one could turn him any way. No one could control or dominate him. He was going to fulfill that which he had been commissioned to do. He was going to keep that word. He was going to do all things that his father intended and sent him to do. He was going to do it. A few misguided followers attempted to make him their king. He just sent them away and went off alone. Had to get away from people like that. Couldn't take them. Now, they weren't going to influence him. He didn't want to be around that kind of nonsense. You see, we know, don't we? He was already king. And there was no earthly throne that could seat him. He was not going to lower himself. 
to take an earthly throne. He's never going to lower himself to take an earthly throne despite all of the books that so-and-so may write. He's already enthroned. See? He came here to show these very things about which David writes. His way is perfect. His word is tried. And then, of course, he is a buckler, a shield to all who trust him. That word buckler makes you think about it, doesn't it? An old English word. The, 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 the English knew. They, they understood about armor better than we do. A buckler. All of scriptural history affirms this reality as God works raising up one kingdom, breaking it down, raising up another, breaking it down, and talking about it ahead of time. So that there be no, there be no, this is not the course of human events. This is not the evolutionary process of, of uh, human uh, political desires and so forth. It's, that's not what it is. Not what the anthropologists think about the, uh, uh, about the way human societies work and they go up and down and back and forth and ebb and flow and all of that. That's just what it looks like when you're down in the middle of the trees. You can't see from one tree to the other hardly. You might see a half a dozen of them, but there's 10,000 trees out there full of life and animals and all this kind of stuff. You're standing in the middle of six trees and you think you know what this whole forest is like? Come on. Amen. Babylon at the height of its power lasted only 70 years. I'm more... I'm, I'm only 10 years from 70. Well, 11 and a half. <laughs> it only lasted 70 years. It was gone. Wiped away in a night, essentially. They came in under the wall. It came in through the waterway. And that very night, Belteshazzar was dead. So much for his authority. I'll make you third ruler in the kingdom. Then you know, yeah, you keep your gifts for yourself. You know, you didn't say that to those kind of rulers. They offered you a gift. You better take it. You better be glad. But Daniel didn't care. He knew. Your time's up. Yeah. Sun may come up on you. It may not. But even if it does, it's only so that they can, that they can see their mark better. Yeah. And that's what happened. And Daniel went right on into the next government. Because you see, ultimately Daniel was subject only to the governor of the nations. Not the governor of a nation, but the governor of the nations, the ancient of days. The one who, the vision of whom he had seen. So Daniel did not fear to speak to Belshazzar. Keep your gifts for yourself. God has displayed the earth as a place where he rewards faith in the context of him being a buckler, a shield. They went from one nation to another, one kingdom to another people. He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed. Do my prophets no harm. He literally said that about Abraham. And Isaac, didn't he? And then, of course, Jacob lived that out, and others lived it out as well. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. The world was not worthy of them. These who lived under the shadow and protection of the, of the buckler and shield of the Most High. And he's, and he's provided the earth to prove this. Those who trust in him, they'll not be ashamed. They'll not act hastily. They don't need to panic. Daniel didn't need to panic about any of these things. Going into the lion's den, now he, we know he didn't know he was going to come out, did he? Just like Hananiah and Ezra, Ezra and Mishael. They didn't, they didn't, they never imagined, as far as we know, that they, that they were going to come out of that furnace. They were going to die there. They kept their mouths shut. I wouldn't be surprised if they 
put their hands behind their back. Go ahead and tie them. I'm not going to bow. And then they walked out. And the men who threw them in there, their bodies, their carcasses were laying there on the pavement or in the dirt. A buckler and a shield. His promise, of course, came to fall. All these promises came to full bloom in the gospel and its exposition. The application, the impact, if you will, for us, the effect for us, is that he is transforming hearts that are yielded to him, transforming the hearts of his devoted servants in his purpose. And nothing, nothing derails that. And that's why we can have the confidence that we do in speaking about these things. It shouldn't be surprising that we speak about these things in the manner that we do. Our God, his ways are perfect. Academics, politicians, they didn't, this, this doesn't have to be worked out by them. God is able, and he is. They may not know that, but we do, that God is working these things out. Governments, military, business, social institutions, financial institutions. God's working these things out. And in the midst of it, we are hidden. And, and, and we walk under the protective shield and buckler of his power. We walk with confidence in his word. That's why we give the attention to it that we do. That's why we focus like a laser beam upon these things that God has said. And we walk in this way that's perfect. We're not stumbling in the darkness, bumping into things, falling over. It may, it may appear that way to some from time to time, but that's only because we're waiting upon the Lord. And we move forward, as the apostles did there in Acts 16, they moved forward waiting for getting He directed, so they turned and responded. We do the same. We do, when, it, when it comes to certain circumstances and so forth. But beyond the circumstances, we know what God is doing. And this is not arrogance. We're, co we're confident in what he's doing. He's told us. He's told us what he's doing. So we join ourselves to these things. We wait for his promises. We walk in the light where his blood cleanses us and sanctifies our willing soul. Having been children of wrath, we're now children of his transformed, born again, living by his word, made ready for the last great day. And by its report of things to come, we have fled into the shadow of his wing and wait, wait for the fulfillment of these things. Now, Israel was not willing to take residence in this place of peace. They wanted worldly peace. They wanted to rest in other things, things that really gave no rest and things that passed away, things that were blown away by the winds of circumstances. Even, even though past generations of their own people had experienced these things, they didn't learn these lessons. They didn't learn. But those who, by faith, in the rock, build upon that rock, they endure these winds and ways of time and the testing. And to them comes this light and this peace and the fulfillment of the riches of God's grace, his immutable counsel. So, brethren, give yourself to these things that he has made known. His way is perfect. It is tried, and our trust in these things will not fall to the ground. He will bring us through in his peace and protection. Thank you, brethren. God's grace and peace.